Pocket Gophers are one of nature's greatest earth movers. They're even better than the Corps of Engineers. Hi, I'm Leonard Askham, vertebrate pest management specialist with Washington State University. During the next few minutes, we're going to see what gophers look like, where and how they live, and when they become a problem, how they can be effectively controlled. Pocket gophers are not always a problem or do they become a pest. In natural environments, pocket gophers are useful in reducing soil erosion and aerating the soil to great depths. The extensive burrow systems allow water to penetrate far below the soil surface. The deeper soils are continuously mixed and brought to the surface where they are deposited as dark crescent-shaped or horseshoe-shaped mounds. Mounds, along with dead plants, are indicators that pocket gophers are active in a specific area. All pocket gophers have stout bodies, are short-legged, have blunt heads, prominent yellow incisor or front teeth, and large, deep, fur-lined cheek pouches on the sides of their face in which they can carry food. Gophers spend most of their time beneath the soil surface and are generally active all year. They do on occasion forage above ground, particularly around the burrow opening where they can quickly escape if they are threatened. They may also migrate above ground in the fall to new territories when their current habitat has become too crowded or when food becomes scarce. Pocket gophers also migrate and develop new burrow systems because they are solitary animals. The only time that more than one animal is found in one burrow system is during breeding season, generally once in the northern United States and Canada, and two or three times in the southern U.S. and Mexico, and when young are being raised by the female. Males are chased away by the female soon after they breed. As I've indicated, several species of pocket gophers are widely distributed throughout the United States. In studies where the animals are watched in glass chambers, gophers were able to dig three feet of tunnel in loose soil in about 10 minutes. In natural conditions, these animals may dig and occupy as much as 800 feet of tunnels or burrows at one time. Most burrows are two to three inches in diameter, parallel to the ground, and depending on the type of soil can be found at different depths. Shallow feeding burrows are sometimes found two to four inches beneath the soil surface. Nests and food caches are generally dug six to eight inches beneath the soil surface. In colder climates, where the top 12 to 24 inches of the soil might freeze, deep winter nests and food caches will be built 24 to 30 inches below the surface. When gophers become a problem, or pest, three types of control measures can be used, either biological, mechanical, or chemical. Biological control is a long-term solution that includes predator management and habitat modification. Nature's own control agents, predators, can be encouraged by changing some of the habitat in the affected area. Thickly grown fence rows and hedges can be grown along the field borders to encourage weasels, foxes, skunks, coyotes, and many other four-legged carnivores. Trees, in which birds of prey, such as hawks and owls, can nest and roost, can be planted and preserved. Where fence rows and trees cannot be quickly grown, or where they might interfere with a growing crop, perching poles and nesting boxes can be erected to help attract the birds to the site. Another often overlooked control method that uses a simple biological principle is forage removal, the simple process of eliminating the animal's food source with either a plow, herbicides, or crop rotation is often enough to eliminate a problem. Gopher control, however, often requires immediate attention, particularly where high-value crops or ornamentals are, ornamentals are involved. When this is the case, direct control procedures become appropriate and effective if a few basic concepts are followed. Gopher control is most effective in the fall after the first heavy rains and when the gophers are most active. Spring control can also be attempted if the population is small and there's a slight chance of reinvasion. Summer and winter control programs are generally counterproductive unless it's in a mild climate. 
The target area should be small enough so that the entire population can be treated at one time, and if necessary, retreated. Third, the appropriate technology should be selected for the size and intensity of the population. Finding the gophers is easy. All you have to do is find a fresh mound and dig a hole at the open end of the horseshoe. Once the holes are open, a variety of control methods can be used. The first is fumigation. Exhaust from diesel or leaded gasoline engines can be used to fumigate a burrow system. It is, however, time consuming and may not kill many of the animals if you have not closed up all of the holes. A less time consuming but expensive method is to use gas cartridges like the one here. Again, all of the exits must be closed so that the gas doesn't escape. Fumigants are only effective in tightly compacted wet soil such as clay or clay loam where the gas can't escape from the burrow system. Gas tablets are slower acting. Two to six tablets are placed into each burrow, covered with water to activate them in dry soil, and then sealed into the chamber with wadded paper and dirt. The wadded paper keeps the gopher from pushing the tablets out of the burrow when they find them. None of the gases are effective in loose, dry, sandy, or sandy loam soils. Gases used in these soils will rapidly spread into the surrounding soil and not throughout the tunnel system where it's the most effective. A more effective control method, particularly on small populations, are traps. Traps can be used when we have only a few animals to catch or are concerned about other animals that might be affected by the use of chemicals such as the ones we just talked about. The right trap, practice, and a little patience, however, are required. Traps used for rats, mice, and larger mammals do not work with gophers. The gopher must be caught in their burrows where space is limited. Two effective gopher traps are the box and the maccabee. Both of these traps should be placed in the main burrow, six to eight inches below the ground where the gopher is most active each day. Each trap should be placed well back into the hole and then secured to a stake with wire or chain so that it cannot be pulled into the burrow by a dying animal or carried off by a scavenger. Traps should be checked and reset two or three times a day until all of the animals have been caught. If you are not sure about your success, leave the holes open for a day and then recheck them. If the holes have been closed, the gopher is still alive, well, and living off your land. Or the population becomes quite large. Trapping becomes very time consuming. When this occurs, a number of alternatives are possible. One of the most common and effective are poison baits. One type of baits are waxed grain bars treated with anticoagulant chemicals that have been developed and tested at two Western universities. Bait bars are a safe and easy to use method designed when there are too many animals to trap and where acute or highly toxic baits cannot or do not want to be used. After the bars have been placed into the burrows and covered with soil, they become a semi-permanent bait station that will last for several months or until the wax that holds the block together sloughs away and the bar dissolves. Bait bars are consumed over a short period of time, generally seven to ten days. Bait bars, like these carrots, are moved to the nest or food cache by the gophers, where they become a short-term reservoir of poison bait for any animal that moves into the burrow system after the current resident has been killed. Each treated area should be checked every two weeks, and where activity reoccurs, new bait bars inserted into the tunnels. Another way of treating gophers is to use poison bait inserted through a hole or with a machine. Instead of digging a hole with a shovel, a sharpened rod or probe can be inserted at the open horseshoe end of the mound until the runway is found. Once the runway has been found, the probe is pulled out, turned over, reinserted, and rotated slightly to enlarge the hole. A teaspoon of bait is then dropped into the burrow and the hole gently closed with a clot of dirt or leaves. 
If not properly closed, the gopher, attracted by the fresh air and sunlight, will plug up the hole and, in the process, cover the bait. Another way to treat gophers is to use a bait dispenser. After the bait has been dropped into the burrows, never stop on the hole like I'm doing here. The loose soil from the hole will cover the bait and the gopher will not find them. The most common gopher baits are strychnine treated oats, barley, corn and milo. Control can generally be accomplished in 24 to 48 hours. Anticoagulant treated grain and pelletized baits are also available. They are also very effective if used properly, but take longer and sometimes require multiple applications before the animals can be controlled. As with all anticoagulant chemicals registered for agricultural use, the targeted species must feed on the treated baits continuously for several days, often five to seven or more before they die. Burrow building machines are designed to place lethal quantities of one and a half to two pounds of rodenticide per acre beneath the soil surface. Artificial tunnels are generally placed at 20 to 25 foot intervals to intersect active burrow systems. A coulter cuts through the sod and roots in front of a plowshare and slotted torpedo. Two packer wheels compact the soil behind the plowshare and over the torpedo while measuring treated grain through a spring-activated trapdoor. Treated grains in the supply tank are dropped into the hollow tube behind the plowshare and into the slotted torpedo where they are left for the gopher to feed on. Burrow builders can be effective for large and extensive populations if the following steps are taken. First, check the soil moisture. Conditions are just right when the soil holds together without crumbling or dripping water. Soils that are too dry or too wet will not build good artificial tunnels. Second, find the average depth of the natural burrows with either a probe or shovel. Then set the depth of the torpedo by adjusting the height of the packer wheels so that the artificial tunnels will be at the same depth as the burrows. Next, set the coulter deeper than the torpedo. If this isn't set properly, like this machine, a large trench filled with broken roots rather than a clean tunnel will be plowed through the soil. Finally, adjust the spring-loaded metering gate so that the right amount of bait is applied with each revolution of the packer wheel. Strychnine-treated grain baits generally work best. Anticoagulant-treated grain baits may also be effective. Pelletized baits should be avoided this machine has had some very important modifications made to it. As we've seen on the or earlier machines, they had straight shanks which gave us some problems. This one has a shank that has been built out at a longer angle. The tube has been extended and also has a beak on the bottom. The other important modification is that it has two spring systems. The first is a spring-loaded coulter that allows it to ride over rocks and large roots without breaking. The leading edge of the plowshare has also been changed. This forces the uncut roots up to the top so that they do not ball up and destroy the artificial tunnel. The third modification has been to replace the shear pin with a tractor clevis that unlocks when the torpedo hits a stationary object. All of these modifications have increased the efficiency of the burrow builder, particularly in rocky soils and forests. Like any method, the machine application of rodenticides has its advantages and disadvantages. The major advantage is that lethal amounts of rodenticides can be efficiently placed at the proper depth over a large area in a relatively short period of time. The major disadvantage is that these machines may promote gopher infestations if they're not used properly. In any control program, few populations are completely exterminated. Most control programs are successful if the number of animals are reduced by 85% or more. When burrow builders are used, like in this orchard on the left, all of the colonies are connected by the artificial tunnels. Animals that have not been killed during the treatment can quickly invade the open burrow systems through the artificial tunnels. Invading animals from untreated border populations can also reinfest the treated field through the artificial tunnels that can last as long as two or three years. Within a short period, the entire site can be completely reinfested and the process repeated. Two modifications can be used to keep this from happening. One is to insert bait bars in the artificial tunnels to kill any invading animals. 
Another is to pull the burrow builder out of the ground between infested areas or in large infestations every 75 to 100 feet. If done properly in moist soils, the torpedo will slide out of the ground after the packer wheels have stopped turning so that no poisoned grains are exposed to other animals. This should not be done in dry soils because the tunnels will collapse or the torpedo will rip out the last few feet and expose the bait. Finally, after you think your work is done, check it out. Each area should be monitored for survivors and emigrants. Before walking away from a treated mound, kick it over. New mounds should be treated as soon as they appear and not left until next year and the colony has had a chance to grow. During the last few minutes, you've had a chance to see what gophers look like, where and how they live, and why it's important as one of the world's greatest excavators. You've also seen how biological approaches, such as habitat management, can be used to achieve long-term results. You have also been introduced to a variety of direct management techniques. These have been fumigants using carbon monoxide, gas cartridges and tablets, traps, bait stations, direct baiting with probes and dispensers, and burrow building machines. All of these management practices and techniques require patience and perseverance. With time, however, they will provide you with effective controls. We hope that these hints have been helpful.